All right. Good evening here from a, a almost springtime here in South Africa on the African continent. And uh, tonight we are going to be focusing on uh, specifically uh, an African topic. Something that we're going to be uh, focusing on here tonight is the topic of language translation, indigenous languages in South Africa. And tonight I have a special guest, uh, something, someone that I found on, on social media. He's, he's doing very interesting work and I've been following his work for a while. And then I thought, or maybe I, I need to share this with more people. Maybe he can inspire more people or just give them some insight into what he does. Because I think what uh, my guest here tonight does, in my opinion, is very important work. So uh, without uh, without a longer uh, stretching out this intro, welcome on the show, uh, Cullen. Uh, the, the, your your other name, uh, you can start off by introducing yourself with your, uh, with your Zulu name as well. Um, I'm going to leave that to you. I will maybe attempt it at the end of the of the show, but welcome. Welcome, welcome on the program, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Ernst. Um, yeah, so uh, I, my name is Cullen McKenzie, um, mm. as, as you said. Um, but I think that the the experience of identity that I have is that there's another thing inside this Cullen McKenzie, and that's my Bengwane, Wakamashina Shina, Wakambila So the yeah, there's that that duality, um, which I think is is a is a common feature of many people's experience in South Africa, is having two different selves or more than one self and more than one name. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is actually it's very hard to explain to people abroad. But uh, your view on it is uh, what I've, I've experienced many times uh, traveling South Africa, meeting different people. There's definitely a phenomenon when you're living in a country of so many different cultural um, groups, so many different linguistic communities, you're bound to find people that can express themselves in different cultural ways, in different languages. I mean, I have a similar experience of being bilingual. When you speak a different language, are you get that feeling of your your personality also adapting? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a widely a commonly referred to phenomenon where people experience speaking in their second or first language as a different aspect or side to their to their personality. Mm, it definitely is. I, I find that. Um, I mean, I've made a, a conscious choice to to write and interact more in IsiZulu and in various Isinguni languages, which is kind of my my second language. Um, and in making that choice, what's interesting is how, um, as you said, my personality changes, um, my voice changes, my approach changes. Um, but I think what's 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 really interesting is that. An act of that act of translation, that the 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 switching between the one self and the other, um, mm -hmm. that you and I are familiar with, that's something which um, means that the the core of your personality remains unchanged, but is changed to suit that situation. And so it's yeah, it's it's awesome. It's wonderful. <laughs> right, but uh, yeah, let's start off with the just the basic things in the. Maybe uh, before we, but well, before I get to that, just a, a quick introduction. I forgot about this. So um, I consider you basically. Uh, you don't put it in your in your Twitter bio, but I consider you a linguist. Uh, you yeah. are a translator. You're a language teacher. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, just a person that is infatuated and fascinated by language and likes to to work with language and develop it and uh, do do your own contribution to to the world mm -hmm. of language, but. Let's start off just with your, your own personal journey. So I think when people read the description of this episode, they'll see that uh, you are currently translating many classic or ancient works uh, into yeah. Isi Zulu. But before we get into that work, can you just tell us a bit more about how you got into this, or how you got onto this path, this very unique specific path of um, basically uh, doing a lot of translation work for an indigenous language here in South Africa that it, I think doesn't uh, always get the attention that it deserves from people like you that uh, translate many uh, classic works or just um, many of the great works uh, of the world into uh, different mm. uh, languages. Sure. So um, it's quite a big question. Uh, essentially, I, I grew up in a multilingual household. Um, mm. Both my parents spoke Isizulu. Um, Dad uh, spoke it as his first language. So he spoke it before he spoke English. Um, my mother learned it as um, a teenager out of school here in Joburg. Um, my father learned his Zulu um, 
in Zulu you would say Wasnela, he he suckled it with his breast milk um, in the area near uh, Dalton. Um, mm. So I grew up in a house where both my parents were speaking in Zulu constantly between themselves and with others because we were um, in a community where we were constantly interacting with people in Zulu. Then my mother also uh, had studied French, um, so she spoke French around me. My father used to uh, swear and make jokes in Spanish and uh, Portuguese. Um, so there, there was lots of different languages. And I think that um, by the time I went to school, I was taught by uh, nuns who spoke German. Um, I was lucky enough to encounter Portuguese speaking people. And I think the way I tell this story, it sounds like I had some exceptional life. Um, I, I don't think I did. I think that I'm just, I was just more conscious of it. I've always loved language. Um, I think that by the time I was um, probably about 10 or 11, I'd, I, I really felt comfortable in a number of different languages. And I've always loved that. But formally speaking, um, I studied French for two and a half years at high school. I studied Afrikaans for two and a half years as well, but switched to Zulu uh, in grade nine. And then upon leaving school, I studied English and classical languages. Um, so English, Greek, and Latin right the way through until um, masters. Uh, and since then, I've picked up various other languages. So I think the the, the love affair, as you mentioned, the sort of infatuation mm. is um, with language in general. But my first two loves were English and Zulu. So, mm. so before we continue, we have a question here from the audience. Um, Sideliner yes. Opinions asks, what does your name mean? <laughs> OK, cool. So um, that's uh, a bit of my, my, I suppose, my origin story that I do need to tell. Uh, <laughs> So my um, my father, as I said, is he's got the similar thing to me. So he is uh, Morris McKenzie, um, and then underneath that he is Mashina uh, Sheda, Ngungul um, and he, uh, when I was born, I'm not his eldest. I'm his youngest. I'm his last born, uh, and he brought me home to the farm that we lived on. Um, in Yarrow, in the Carcliffe. Uh, Yarrow was the name of the farm. And I was presented to the Induna, uh, who worked with us and lived with us. And the Induna took me and held me. My father describes it, held, held me in a single hand, looked at me and said, uh, This is an old spirit. Uh, this is my Bengwan. And my Bengwan is a wood owl. Um, the male wood owl apparently speaks in Zulu. A lot of birds do in Zulu. And the bird says, Wars, wars in my bengwa. Wars, wars in my bengwa, which is come, come my bengwa. Um, mm. So, why the Induna thought that my name was my bengwa, I'm not entirely sure, but it seems to suit me. Uh, <laughs> it's, got, it's got connotations. Um, owls are not uh, always well liked or well regarded. Uh, the birds of ill omen, um, but mm. the, this particular one, the association is with kind of whirling passion. Um, like mm. uh, I get, I'm not very calm. Uh, let's just put it that way. <laughs> Choleric might be the way to describe it. So that's that's the association there. I hope that mm. answers. Put my finger yeah, on. I think uh, I think that answers the question uh, from the audience perfectly. Um, so I wanted to th get into the the real uh, meat and potatoes of the conversation and that is your your work that you're doing i'm i'm assuming it you're not uh, you're doing it as a hobby or are you doing your translation work as your full-time job so uh that's a uh it's a short question but a rather long answer but i'll see if i can mm. i can summarize it um i have uh since the beginning of 2021, I have my own business, um, and that business is um, linguistic and social consulting. So I am um, open to a whole lot of projects that fit that brief. Um, but my two major partners or clients at the moment are Southern uh, South African Heritage Publishers, and the other one is the South African National Lexicography Units. Um, and the work with them um, is work. 
obviously, but it's also stuff mm. that I love. So the SA Heritage work, I began that work in 2020, and it's translating archival material that's been sitting unseen since 1960. Um, and that's been amazing. That's been mind blowing because it's pieces of so history. Just quickly, which, excuse me, yeah. before you continue, just for context, that translation that you're doing specifically there with the archival work is from English to Isi Zulu. No, oh, so Isi Zulu um, to English. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the the uh, I think about forty percent of the texts I worked with were Isi Zulu to English. Um, I'd say forty to fifty percent were either is Tosa or is Tobi or is Baka, so sort of marginal um, mm. versions of Isinguni between Isizulu and Isikosa. And then the remainder have been in Isilala, which is a dialect that is no longer written or spoken. Um, so that's been a challenge. Uh, but yes, yeah, so those are those are all archival works. Um, and that's, uh, it kind of um, is an extension of the work that I've done in classics. So mm. I've always been interested in uh, what's called epigraphic studies or um, papyrology. So looking at the, the 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 stuff that's started to decay but still contains information that can be salvaged. Um, so that's why I like the archival work. Mm. Um, yes. So that's essay heritage, and that I, I do as a job. Then Sunlu, uh, I'm working primarily with the revision of the Isisulu English Dictionary. Um, which is, that's awesome work. Um, but then the other translation is just purely for, for me. Um, and that's the one that we're here about today. It's translating Homer, uh, I think. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So excuse me, just that, uh, what you mentioned there, the revision of the, the Zulu, uh, dictionary, can you elaborate sure. a bit on that? Sure. So, uh, I have owned four different copies of this dictionary um, because mm. I've used it hard. Uh, I, I, I use it and it falls apart in my hands. And I've uh, so I, I think I've, I've read it a few times uh, in the course of translating and then teaching and researching. And this dictionary is kind of the standard for uh, bilingual dictionaries in South Africa. The standard for trilingual is the massive greater dictionary of Isklosa. That is a beautiful thing. Um, it's huge. Uh, it's comprehensive. It has everything. But the Dokan Vilagazi, that's the one we're talking about. That mm -hmm. is the, I think, the gold standard for Isisulu English. Uh, and it has 24,700 lemmas. So it's a lot of information. And we're about, mm, I'd say, 7% of the way through it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, every mountain you climb starts with the first, <clears throat> uh, the big things to do. Um, what I also wanted to ask you on that note is when, it, before we get to specifically your, your translation work, before we, uh, went live, you were talking about specifically how there's this misconception about translation where people just think it's taking one word and finding a matching one in another language. But it seems from you started explaining it, and I said we actually need to talk about this on air. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded a lot more complex than that. Uh, can you uh, can you get into that? So the just the the act of translation and uh, why it's more complex than people might think. Oops, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try not to make this sound like um, translation studies 101. <laughs> I'm going to try and make it a bit more interesting. Uh, I think that there's, um, there is, there's a misconception that translation involves something like Google Translate, where you put in a word and you get an equivalent in another language. So sometimes that is, and that works for single words. Uh, if you're lucky, you can manage to produce a phrase that way. But translation is about so much more than that. I think the, the translation of a technical text Let's start there. So hmm. uh, if I think through my my experience as a translator, I started with, I think my very first long text was an instruction manual for how to use machines that were used in cutting and dyeing animal hides. So, I mean, that's not exciting at all. <laughs> but it's, it's very easy to uh, get a one-to-one -one relationship there because it's just instructions. It's just basic stuff. 
Then the next one, if I go up a notch, uh, was a translation of a historical text um, for an exhibition. Now, that's from English to Isuzulu. That also presents an issue. And the historical text, you immediately get into problems of connotation. So if I use this word, what, uh, what is the connotation of that word in the language that I'm, I'm coming from? And what is the connotation in the language into which I'm translating? So, for example, um, in, the, uh, in the, the, the text that I was translating, if I were trying to translate the word struggle in a political context, and I were to look it up in a dictionary, it would give me two, maybe three different meanings. And those meanings would not be equal. I'd have to find out what, what the, the deeper connotation of those words were. Then if I go one step further and I go to literature, then it's not even about connotation. It's also about style. It's also about feeling, emotional force, metaphor, idiom. And that's, it's, it, uh, it, I think you and I, we were talking before the show started, because we're fundamentally bilingual. I think that there is that sense of knowing that I can take a thought, which is like the core, and it's almost wordless, and then I can translate it into English, I can translate it into Afrikaans, I could translate it into Zulu. And that translation involves a, a shift in personality. It involves a shift in uh, tone of voice, obviously, sometimes sense of humor. Uh, I know um, my paragon for this is the person who was first my lecturer and then my colleague, um, and now my friend, um, Mr. Mike Lambert at the University of Kwazulu Natal in Peter Maritzburg. And he, he speaks, I think, about 12 languages fluently. And his whole personality changes when he becomes Senor Miguel and he's speaking Spanish. He's much more florid. Everything's a bit more, you know, he moves his body differently. And then when he switches to speak Greek, it's totally different. So I think that, yeah, the, the translation, the act of translation is something that happens every day in South Africa for so many people. And it's, it's, a, it's an unexamined act. We don't think about what it means that someone has to translate themselves multiple times during the day. Um, hmm. yeah. yeah, but uh, sometimes just going that little bit of an extra mile makes such a difference. Just, for example, in a friendship or an encounter or any uh, such a social setting where... Mm -hmm. I mean, when I'm, I moved to Pretoria from the Western Cape about three years ago, and since mm. I moved here, I've been not as much as I want to, but a little bit by little bit, I'm learning uh, Sichuan. Oh, cool. And the little bit that I know so far, um, mm. just greeting, how are you? I'm well. Uh, mm. Just greeting someone in their home language, just immediately. Well, firstly, uh, often if... Uh, uh, if if I just greet uh, someone in Sichuan here in Pretoria, mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. it catches them off guard. Yes, um, but yeah. it's but it's a and then and then you just get a, a smile from ear to ear because then yes. it's yeah. it's a unique experience and it's. Yeah. I mean, the same goes. I can I can uh, attest to the same. If if someone that I know is not first language Afrikaans mm -hmm. greets me in Afrikaans, they mm -hmm. are doing they make taking the extra step they're just doing a little bit of effort to greet someone in their home language it immediately just uh breaks the tension it makes that uh, that encounter so much better and so much nicer and i just took the logic of many of the times uh Chwana people here in pretoria will greet me in afrikaans and they'll say goodbye in afrikaans and i can't mm. even say hello or goodbye in their language so i learned mm. the first thing i learned was hello and goodbye and uh, then also uh, there's this uh, nice story of so in in Afrikaners usually say moi uh, uh, or walk well, but yes, that's uh, yeah. that's a uh, that's an influence from uh, encounters with other uh, uh, black communities in South Africa where they say, yes. for example, in Sichuana, chamaya sentle, yes. uh, which is also walk well. But it's yes. the Afrikaners started saying walk well because they mm. they heard it from their tribes that they encountered, which is a fascinating, just a little trivial part of history. But it's. Yes. It's it's such a nice thing to know that little connection that uh, mm. we say walk well uh, or moi loop because mm. of uh, that interaction. 
Yeah, I think it's, um, I, it, I've often thought as I've traveled around South Africa, the, um, the influence that um, Afrikaans culture and indigenous culture have had on each other. That has been, mm. it's been really wonderful. The signs of respect I see in the comment there. What mm. I love is the fact that of all the uh, West Germanic languages, Afrikaans is one of the few where markers of respect are words like um, funny. Mm. Okay? In the same way that in, in indigenous languages you would use ubaba or dada or ndade or whatever, or re, you put that in front of the thing. So it's it's very interesting to me the way that, I mean, obviously, cultures that have been in contact for this long must have influenced each other linguistically, socially. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's, it's, it's wonderful to see um, the, how easy it is for someone to move between using uh, Setswana and Afrikaans, um, mm -hmm. or between, I mean, in the, the Eastern Cape, uh, I've done some work down there in Addo and the Sundays River Valley. The switch, the trilingualism of the children is just amazing. They're moving between English, Afrikaans, and, and it's closer constantly. Um, mm. So the markers of respect are, are lovely. And I think that the, I'm seeing more and more people who are able to, as you say, say hello, say thank you, say goodbye. Um, and that moi lop is always, I love it, because uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a feature of almost all of the, the Southern African uh, languages, mm. the way of saying goodbye, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I'm, I've, I can only speculate where that comes from, but there's a, sure. there's a, a little bit more of a, a personal touch to it uh, in the, in European languages, you just say until we meet again, or until exactly. we see each other again, some variants of that. But yes. in, in uh, many African languages, uh, specifically from my experience here with South African, uh, Southern African languages, there's mm. always that hint of, I hope you are safe on your travels, or I hope you are protected and safe until we see each other again. Yeah, um, and yeah, mm. where, wherever that comes from, there's probably an interesting story there, but I've definitely picked up on it. And it's very nice that uh, Afrikaans as a language that was formed here in Southern Africa also picked up on that and uh, made it part of uh, that language of, of, of that language as well. Mm. Um, there was a question for you here, Cullen. I just want to yes. find it here. Yes. Sideliner Opinions asks, was the development of Zulu language influenced by other languages? And uh, if uh, I'll just add to that, if the answer is yes, uh, can you mm. elaborate a little bit on that? Cool. Um, this is a really, really interesting question. Uh, I think it's... Um, any language is influenced by other languages because the way we speak is a, is a marker of uh, how we interact with each other, but it's also a response to our environment. It's a response to um, the other groups of people we meet and the interactions we have with them. I, um, I mean, obviously this language we're speaking in now uh, is one which I wouldn't even say has been influenced. I'd say it is like a Frankenstein monster of a language. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it has very little. I think it has about 5 to 10%, which is originally um, British. The rest of it is from elsewhere. This is Zulu. Is, I, I don't like using words like pure or diluted or any of that to think of languages. But uh, what mm. I want to think of is the degree of uh, diversity across the language group. So mm. let's talk about it that way. Because... If you think of, for example, French, French prior to the French Revolution um, and standardization had about 12 major dialects. Okay? German, Deutsch has so many, so many different dialects. And Zulu, I think, um, initially before the paramountcy, before um, Ilembe or Ushaka Gasendangakona unified and standardized, there were similarly lots of different languages. Um, and I think that the the way that Isi Zulu, which is just the, the Zulu way, the Zulu way of speaking, came to dominate others, meant that those languages were incorporated. Um, so you there's a there for example um, Isi Kwabe um, became incorporated into Isi Zulu. Um, some of the uh, Nguane and Duandwe languages also became incorporated. Um, the, the really interesting thing is the way that Isizulu responded to difference. So there are, for example, um, words that are borrowed, 
absolutely, just like English or Afrikaans. Um, and those words are from some from European languages, some from other African languages. And the I'd say the spread of those across the language is maybe five to ten percent of the language is just direct borrowings. Um, most of those are modern words, uh, although some of them are words which uh, where the English word has been preferred over the, the indigenous word. Then go a little bit deeper. There are certain words in all of the Nguni languages that are direct borrowings from uh, Tora or Tam or Nama or the, any of the other indigenous um, hunter-gatherer or pastoral nomad languages, um, commonly known as uh, Khoi and San, which are both incorrect words for the languages. And there are lots of words which seem to have come through there. I haven't done as much uh, research into that area as I would like, but my feeling is that the, there's a, a core of the language which came with the migration and which is common to all of the languages from here up to the Great Lakes. And then there are other words which were incorporated, which are from languages that were spoken here. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's, Mm. The development of it and its influence by other languages has been, for the most part, one where Isisulu will Zulufy something quite quickly. Uh, Iskosa is better. <laughs> Iskosa uh, classifies things far more quickly and quite mm. often uses the third method. So instead of um, direct borrowing uh, and making up a new word, um, what Tulsa does is it reuses an old word that has fallen into disuse to explain a new concept. And I think that that's also an interesting uh, way to respond. Hmm. Sideline, I don't I, have to answer. <laughs> I think that uh, answers his question. Uh, David Martin says, Ive stile is fenster. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the cool thing there is um, fenster is from fenestra, which yeah. is Latin. Okay. So, um, so Dutch and Proto Germanic borrowed it from Latin and then it came to English or to Dutch and came to the southern tip of Africa and it closer was like if I steal. okay fantastic um, yeah. and uh, Zulu because it was spoken slightly differently said if I steal. okay so if I steal and if I steal are just different versions of fenêtre or fenestra or fenster <laughs> that's 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 the fascinating thing about language yeah. um Carl and i wanted to actually get into uh this book um i'm lucky enough to have oh, it here cool um Which translation I, is get... that? Sorry, I have to ask you <laughs> sure uh let's see uh um I don't know. How will I see which translation it is? Yeah, hold it up to me. So let me see. Because <laughs> I'm I'm a bit of a fan of these ones. Let's uh, go up. Uh I'm not sure that looks like. It could be the Robert Fagels. Does it say Fagels mm. on the spine or on the back? Uh, there's the publisher. Uh, okay, cool. I think it is. All right, let's carry on. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll get back to you on, on that detail. Um, sure. So, yeah, so what... How did you get to this point where, I mean, of course, you're going to have to start thinking, okay, if, um, if I want to start translating some works, where, I'm, where mm. am I going to start? Now, of course, I, I don't think you started with the, the Iliad, but uh, I want to focus mm. on this because this, this caught my eye the first time. Mm. How, how did you decide on this is what I want to do? I want to make this my project. I want to translate this ancient work, the Iliad, mm. into Isizulu. Ah, so I um, I grew up with Isisulu, and I not only grew up with that, I grew up in a very traditional experience of Isisulu. Uh, my father was a member of the IFP, and mm -hmm. we were <laughs> we were in we were living in Eshawe uh, from about 1987, and we were constantly involved in traditional ceremonies and traditional uh, rituals, and I think. That sense of um, that culture made sense to me when I encountered it again as an adult reading the Iliad. And I felt that there was a resonance there. 
there's some kind of resonance between that feeling of uh, glory, of honor, kedos, okay, um, of the the experience of warriors going off to battle, um, and I think the the interference of the gods is very much like sometimes the interference of the Amazonasi, uh, the Abapanzi. So I think that they uh, that always appealed to me. So there was a there was a resonance when I encountered Homer as a teenager, reading it in translation. I immediately wanted to read it in the original. And that's something that I've always wanted to do. So I read Dante in translation. I wanted to read it in the Italian. So I then sought out a way of learning ancient Greek. And when I did, it was, it just, it resonated with me so much more than Latin ever did. I studied Latin when I was uh, in Senate four, uh, grade six. And I, it was logical and clear and, you know, fine and there's a rational explanation for everything but greek is so much more messy it's so much more visceral uh it's it feels a lot like somewhere between afrikaans and portuguese in the that that sort of like there's a there's you have to do things with your mouth that that means you really have to get your teeth into the language um so i i i, I thought someone challenged me that's the short answer I was a postgrad and I was at a conference and there was, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to embarrass people, but there was a professor who had made a version of, of the Iliad in South African English. And I being 22 and a little bit arrogant at that point said, I put my hand up and said, sorry, but don't you think it's about time that someone translate this into an African language? I mean, it was translated into Afrikaans in the 50s. Great, cool. Mm. But what about translating it into Isisulu? And he threw the question back at me. And he said, well, you can do it, can't you? I mean, you've been doing some, you've been doing some translation. Why don't you do it? So that was, that was quite a long time ago. I'm a lot grayer now. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I've learned a lot more about what it would take and so it's really taken me this long to sort of get my head around what it takes to actually translate this. Sorry, I missed that comment. What was? Oh, it was a uh, sideline opinion said the Zulu culture is part of you, Mabinguane, and will always be. That is where your roots are, a true white African without any doubt. <laughs> Thanks, sideline. Cool. Uh, Artie Panda says, I'm really enjoying the stream. Well, Artie, thank you very much for tuning in. You're always here in the, in the comments, and I really appreciate uh, your feedback. Um, Colin, yeah, on that point, mm. I think you mentioned something very interesting there. Uh, the parallel between I, I absolutely believe there's the warrior cultures or cultures with a strong, uh, uh or I would almost say militaristic character to them. Yeah. I mean, it's undeniably when it comes to the Zulu culture. Yeah. Um, I think those types of cultures in Afrikaans, you'd say elephant on clunk with Makar, they resonate yeah. with each other. There's a they resonance, do. I think, when when one warrior type culture reads the stories and the myths of another one or mm. listens to this the, the war stories of another. So I think you your logic there is sound when it comes to uh, this would be the perfect type of work as a little experimental project uh, mm. to to translate. Um, so I, I, I completely agree. I think I would have a similar uh, thought if you were just to ask me, why is uh, Homer's the Iliad uh, a good candidate for this type of project? Mm. Um, mm. Fainor makes a very interesting point. He says both, I'm, I'm assuming Greek and the Zulu, yeah. have a strong oral tradition as well. Do you have a comment on that? I do. Thank you, Fernal. Um, so I, uh, one of the major advantages of working between um, archaic Greek, like Homer, and Isisulu, is that they both rely so much on their orality. They are so heavily laced with things like assonance, alliteration, um, formulaic epithets uh there's there are whole lines i mean there's sort of 25 lines where a sacrifice takes place and it's repeated verbatim throughout the iliad or where a ship is launched and the ship is launched in exactly the same way each time but it's told beautifully and you can hear 
the rhapsode, the bard, reciting those yeah, things. Stories that are meant to be told, not to be read, actually. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's what's, what's so beautiful about it, is so much of, uh, of translation relies on the characters of the two languages being the same. Uh, if they're too different, the translation is going to feel very different from the original. And I think that in this case, the fact that, um, I mean, not to go too deep into the linguistics, but the, uh, the case endings in Greek, for example, um, and the fact that there's uh, agreement between nouns and adjectives, that's something which um, Isisulu has and English doesn't really have. So there's a, a sound quality that would link two words across lines, which in English would sound weird. So when reading a translation of the Iliad, uh, I'm always conscious of whether it feels like Greek that's just been Englished or whether it feels like English. And I think that the, the challenge, so it's a wonderful thing that they're both oral cultures. I mean, that that's, goes without saying. But the challenge is that Greek, though it was an oral culture and orally transmitted, Homer is still written in hexameter. And that is a very rigid um, structure. Now, I've done some metric analysis of the, the prose poetry of Isisulu, and there's no clear meter. It's, there's rhythm, certainly. There's an internal rhythm to the line, but there's no meter. So how do I work with that? I don't know. <laughs> I, mm. I haven't figured that out yet, but I'm getting there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, now that you mention it, when you're talking about, uh, well, when we're on the topic of oral cultures, I've, I don't think there is a culture in the world that doesn't have uh, that strong connection to the language associated mm -hmm. with that culture as well. I mean, uh, um, my favorite Afrikaans philosopher, Impia van Weyck Lowe, wrote endlessly about the connection between language and culture. And if you were to destroy the language, that culture would be uh, either permanently, completely uh, transformed or destroyed uh, in the process. Um, mm -hmm. That language, he, he used the metaphor of a river, that if the culture is the water of the river, the language is the riverbed on which the, the water flows. Mm -hmm. um, but That's I wanted to point. ask you on that point, specifically in your experience within the Zulu culture and with your ample experience uh, with the Zulu language, mm. can you just, I mean, of course, the, it goes without saying that there's a, a strong correlation and significance of language within every culture, but specifically within mm. the Zulu culture, how did you, how have you experienced that and uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Mm. Wow. So... I think that the the intersection between language and culture when it comes to uh, to Isisulu is very much a sense um, similar to what you find with um, with English, in that there is a uh, a central core pristine version of the language that is held in the area around Kwanongoma, where we saw all the activity this last weekend. Mm. Um, that is regarded as kind of the, the heartland Zulu. And then, and that is the, the language which has become the standard. And it is seen to be that when one performs a, a ritual that is called Mkosi, so a, a royal ritual, then the language that is spoken is very much that royal Zulu. So there's, there's the dialect, which is, is the, the, the king's, the king's Zulu much like there's the Queen's English. But there is also existing in each person who lives in Guazulu, the sense that they are not only loyal to Isilo and his Isizulu, which is Punga no Makeba. It's named after the, the mythical, or not mythical ancestors, sorry, the ancestors of the present King, uh, Punga and Makeba. The language is called that um, mm. as a shorthand. And then, each Zulu person, because Zulu is actually the wrong word here, each um, indigenous person living under uh, the Guazulu in the, the, the terrain or the region of Zulu, they also speak Ulimilueskoti. So they also speak their language of a valley, so their valley language. And their valley language is the language they speak to their ancestors in. Because why would Gogo suddenly 
be able to understand this other language. Gogo speaks my language. Hmm. Nkulu speaks my language. So I will speak to them in the language of my, of my people, of my heart. I will use the words that only our people use in this valley. Hmm. Um, so I think that there is, as long as people are speaking to the ancestors, they will be speaking to them in, in their language. And the sadness for me is there are so many people, I mean, up here, for example, up in Joburg, there's so many people who have become so separated that their language has become something else. So there's a there's an urban version that's spoken here. And so it's uh, I, I try not to get sad, and I'm certainly not a, a purist. Um, I believe that language is always in flux. But it does make me sad when I think about uh, the dialects that are no longer spoken um, and the poetry that doesn't make sense to anyone without a dictionary. <laughs> so... Mm. Hmm. There's a comment here from Feynor that says, I can't imagine keeping the, the metra uh, uniform in a translating poetry. It takes some doing. Uh, he just corrected his uh, one little <laughs> typo there. It certainly does. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about this. I, I know that this may, be, uh, may geek out a little bit. I'll try not to. Um, the, the major problem that each culture has faced in translating Homer particularly has been what to do with the meter. So uh french opted because it didn't have hexameter it opted for the alexandrian for the most part which is their sort of epic verse style uh italian has tried terza rima um, which is very much what dante used in the divina commedia um and then english looked at this and was like mm, none of these really sound good in english so we're going to try uh iambic pentameter and of course, we all know what, that, what happened with that. Why I'm mentioning this is that in some cases, languages had to invent or adapt other forms to suit themselves. And the effect that that had on their literature was profound. So the, there was a name I mentioned earlier when we were talking about dictionaries, Vilaganzi. Now, mm. He's my linguistic superhero. He is fantastic. Um, he was taken from us way too soon. I think he was only 45 years old, but he compiled the dictionary and he also in his master's thesis wrote about the need to work with meter in and particularly in translating Greek and Latin poetry because he spoke Greek and Latin and he'd worked in it. So there's a sort of an unfinished quest there. Uh, which is very interesting. And he, he started to speculate that there were some forms that could be used. The, 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 the coward's choice here, Ernst, is to go with a prose translation. Uh, so Samuel Butler did that. Okay. Uh, a few others have done that. Prose translations are the way when doing it in Japanese or in Mandarin. Uh, I think, I'm not sure. Arabic has probably done a verse translation as well as a prose translation. So there's, there's an option. I don't, as you can see, I want to do verse because I like the poetry. I think it's a challenge. Yeah, uh, I actually wanted to mention, uh, let me just get it without making too much noise. Um, <laughs> when it comes to uh, epic poems, uh, yeah. my favorite one is uh, Raka by... Um, Empire van Wijk Lowe, which is yes. probably the best epic poem ever written in the Afrikaans language. Mm. Um, and the thing is, I always think to myself, I don't think this work, it's possible to perfectly translate it into English. And that's just mm. my personal experience from reading it over and over again. Mm. And then I realized, but that should also then be applied to every other epic poem in every other language in the world where it will never perfectly be able you can do your best you can do a very good job but i mm. don't think you can ever it's ever possible to really mm. capture every all the magic that's in the original work in the original language that it was written so that's a that i always see it as a challenge i uh i remember so it's a, it's a weird memory but um when i was in sergio greek uh and it was just me I was I was the third year Greek class. <laughs> um, uh, Mike uh, gave us our exam and our my exam. He gave me my exam, and I sat in this room. and He said, "There is no time limit. You have your dictionaries there. 
the texts are in front of you. You can write for the rest of the day if you want, but you have to render a translation. And I, I looked at him and I said, does it have to be a perfect translation? And he just laughed. He said, there's no such thing as a perfect translation. <laughs> you find an approximation, some combination of words in English that somehow fits the, the feeling and beauty of the text and also links to how you feel at this exact moment. So it's a, mm. it's a weird, like a crystallization of a moment. And it's why I love, um, for example, uh, Robert Fagel's translation more than I love uh, some of the others, like Mendelssohn. I uh, don't like him so much. Um, Mandelbaum, sorry, not Mendelssohn. Um, and then there's, I think that the, the choices we make as translators are always hard. There's always going to be some place where either the manuscript is rotten and you can't make sense of what the word is, or there is no equivalent in the language. That you're translating into but i'm a firm believer in footnotes um no i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> I, I think that sometimes they have to be compromises so a, a version that i'm satisfied with now in 10 years time when i come back to the text i might be unsatisfied with and i might want to change a word um so that's always a challenge though mm. uh, i see uh, a sideline of opinions posted a quote in the chat he says they can take our diamonds away from us and every other material resource but not our culture we have a hold on uh, we have to hold on to something man does not survive mm. without culture man bonetti mm. sierra leone mm. and then he also gave you a massive challenge i maybe one day <laughs> he says you need to translate raka into isi zulu next <laughs> that's a that's a big challenge i'll have to really really improve my afrikaans i'll have to ask uh, <laughs> my wife uh, to help me with that too afrikaans is far better mm. than mine so. well it's a <laughs> it's a truly african story about uh, uh mm. well, i'm not gonna gonna spoil everything but i think it's it's one of the books or one of the the, the works that i always recommend my readers if they are uh, blessed with being able to read afrikaans they should definitely mm. read it. it's one of the things you need to put on your list um and written by a by a africana philosopher that i think loved language more than uh, anyone i've ever read or anyone that i've ever encountered living or uh, deceased um yeah and i see uh um dagbreaker says the best footnote i ever read was i once saw it in a dream can't remember where <laughs> i can i do remember where that was um it's yeah. it's in a footnote to uh, uh it's again it's a classical text it reminds me of a story I heard when I was at a, a CASA conference at, at University of Pretoria, where the one um, old lecturer said, you know, I remember when, when I was an undergrad, there was a seminar held by the two professors in the department. And the seminar involved them arguing about who was right about a translation of Homer. And the one said, no, but I know that this is the correct translation. He said, well, how do you know? He says, because I spoke to Homer last night. So, you know, so there's, there's a lot of crazy, but I love this. I once saw it in a dream. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, before we continue, uh, Yiz says, uh, sorry, late today. I had to stream on my channel due to a scheduling issue. I'll be starting the stream over and listening to from the beginning. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the entire stream. And he says, uh, thank you, Mr. McKenzie, for being here today. Um, well, thank you very much, Yiz, for tuning in. Um, Cullen, just a few more things I wanted to get to before we start wrapping up. Um, there's a there's a quote. I can't remember if it's from your bio or the Essay Heritage Publishers bio, but it's an idea that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is preserving the future of our past. Now, whether it's from, from your bio or theirs, I think what you described here tonight is anyway doing exactly that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, uh, can you uh, elaborate a bit on that sentiment of preserving the future of our past through what you're doing? So I think that the, the interesting thing to me is that it, it really is a miracle that we've managed to sustain culture this long. It is an act of, of tradition, of literally handing from one generation to another, from one person to another. And I think that the, 
the future of our past is obviously an, an antithesis, which is nice from a philosophical point of view, because it's looking at what will happen to these things that we remember now that may not be remembered in the future. How do we make sure that they will be? What medium do we need to use to ensure that they survive? Um, I, I am always humbled by the fact that Homer's Iliad was only written down 2,700 years ago, and it was spoken and sung for hundreds of years before that. And if it were not for a couple of monks uh, escaping Constantinople at just the right moment, we wouldn't have a whole lot of classical texts. So mm. I'm aware of just how tenuous the link is between this ancient wisdom and our present situation. There's a very fine thread passing one thing to another. And I th so I think that when, when I heard this byline, which is from SA Heritage, it's not my bio, mm. uh, I, it made sense to me because a lot of my work as an adult has been about trying to keep things alive that mm. I believe are important. The things that I believe are important are language and culture and heritage and history, because I believe that they are what makes us human. They are essential. Without them, we would just be animals. Um, and I think that knowing where we come from and making sure that our children know and they know our history and they, in all, warts and all, they must know everything. Uh, they must know who we were. They must know where we came from, but they must also know our stories. And I think our stories in this case as human stories, I believe that we suffer so much from a kind of a, a dilution and a dumbing down of things and we need to embrace these stories we we need to each of us i think it should be a fundamental part of our education to know something about the iliad or something about dante uh something about you know french poetry or japanese poetry or you know those things are important and here in south africa there is a very real risk that if someone doesn't preserve history, it'll just, it'll just dissolve. It'll just be washed mm. away. It'll be lost as we move for the next thing. So maybe mm. if we make the history something that the future will want, it will be something that will stick around. Mm. Well, that's the thing is I think if I remember correctly, the Iliad is actually part, was part of a series of works, um, but they are yeah. lost to history now. We only have the one. It's like uh it's uh, not a, a great example but think of any think of your favorite series of uh, fictional book books or works from modern times and imagine in a thousand years that only one of those books survived it's yeah. uh, it's it a absurd thought excuse me it won't be the good one it'll be the, no. <laughs> it'll be the rubbish season okay so like you liked season one it was amazing season two was even yeah. better season three will survive okay, so. <laughs> And people um, are going to think it's one of the best things ever written. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, when I was teaching um, teaching Greek tragedy, I, I used to say to people, all right, so how many surviving works do we have? We have about, you know, 47. That's it. How many works were performed over the whole of classical Athenian history? Hundreds, thousands. Mm. And we have this little group. We have seven plays. By Probably one the table scraps. <laughs> exactly. Like, why did this survive? Well, one of them survived because it was literally thrown away on a rubbish heap. So, you know, th that's why it survived. So it's amazing to me. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's that's why we have this incredible responsibility, every generation throughout time to preserve what we can or do what we can to help preserve all these great works or even the lesser works, uh, yeah, even the, even works. season three, even the bad season that you know what he likes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's so many interesting questions and comments coming in from the, the audience here tonight. Uh, Feynor says, reading the yeah. in prose style is borderline sacrilege. Daniel, yes, Watts makes, <laughs> Daniel Watts makes a very interesting comment. He says, um, uh, this isn't just true of poetry. There's a giant kerfuffle regarding Russian novel translations. One school favors capturing the text accurately. The other favors capturing the spirit of the text. Precisely uh which school are you <laughs> i'm uh i'm more in favor of the spirit uh i i believe that there's 
I will try for accuracy, but if accuracy interferes with how it sounds or feels, then I'll go with how it sounds or feels. <laughs> mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give the chat a little bit more TLC before we continue. Uh, Pietra Meiberg says, Eugene Mareu, Kote is Ivanki in scroll. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. Perfect, mooi gestel. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> Daniel, uh, Daniel, you know, I'm, see, there I'm switching over to Afrikaans <laughs> again, reading him as Daniel. Daniel Watts <laughs> says, uh, I know Fagel is the most faithful to Hexameter. However, as a monolingual Englishman, Pope sounds more beautiful to me. Uh, Pope for me uh is just beautiful I, I i love alexander pope and i know i'm in a minority there but i studied him for my honors i looked at the rape of the lock and how it was a mock epic of homer because pope had spent so much time translating uh he translated homer uh, his particular favorite was horace he loved the satires in latin um so yeah i think pope managed to do things with meter which were very interesting um, mm. So I'm hoping I'll be able to do something like that with Zulu. Let's see. Mm. Now, the final thing that I wanted to talk to you about, Cullen, is uh, oh. we, we didn't uh, get to all the questions. So I'm, I'm definitely going to have to uh, chat to you again in the future. But there's one that I really wanted to get to, and that is, according from your experience, mm. the importance of being able to read beautiful books in your mother tongue as opposed to mm. just reading them, learning English and reading them in English. What is the importance of reading it in your mother tongue your first language the language that you dream in the language of your heart the language of your your thoughts mm. now this is this is probably the most important question i uh, i think that the the crucial word in the question you asked is the word beautiful and i am definitely from the school of thought that believes that that aesthetics are important in art and literature the reason for that is that they create a desire in the reader to also similarly produce beautiful things in language. And that's obviously uh, Aristotelian, I can't escape it. So the idea of mimesis here that, that by reading beautiful things, your brain is also fed with that beauty and able to produce things that are beautiful. The, the crucial thing for me is being able to read well-constructed, artfully rendered things in Isizulu has been a search that I've been on most of my life. I found a couple of novelists that I really enjoyed, um, a couple of poets that I really enjoyed, and then I have had to settle because unfortunately a lot of the literature written since sort of 1980 has been very realist. And I don't, I'm not a great fan of realism, uh, I can tolerate George Bernard Shaw in English, but really it's tolerate, okay? Um, and I'm not great I'm not great on that. I'm personally, as a writer, I'm more in the speculative fiction territory, and there's just nothing like that in Sicily. Unless one goes to fairy tales, folk tales. So I've spent a lot of adult life just searching for these old folk tales. I think that the most important thing for me is that I grew up hearing my father speaking beautifully in Isisulu. That has been the most crucial influence on my thinking in Isisulu. Hearing him, hearing other traditional leaders, uh, hearing uh, sermons and religious discourse in Isisulu, that all created a sense of beauty, a sense of this language is not just for business, this language is not just to do work in, this language is to think and dream and imagine and uh, and love and write poetry and it's 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 beautiful but that's not an experience that a lot of my students currently have so sadly um they're not being exposed to beautiful things so their whole experience is one where they're being denied they're being gatekept they're being denied access to the beauty of this really. whereas for them the only recourse is if English is their mother tongue, then sure, they can experience beautiful things in their mother tongue. But if their mother tongue is Isisulu, they're certainly not experiencing that. For me, I was lucky. I think that it, what does it do? It allows for one's brain to similarly create beautiful things, like I said. It allows for some openness to the 
potential of the language. The dreaming in a language means that the language is being used to create your reality. I mean, we're not, I'm not going to go all sapir wharf on you and say, you know, your language creates a reality, but it's close to that. I think that that's, that's what we're talking about. Hmm. Well, Colin, that's a perfect way to end it. I think that's the perfect thought to leave the audience with, to think about, keep at the back of their mind uh, this week and in the year ahead. Um, I just want to read something uh, here from the chat. Daniel van der Westeisen says, Afrikaans is very a very descriptive language, like candy floss is spook awesome. Yeah, kind of mm. full and er far. Yeah. Yep. So yep. He, just to translate for the, the audience here that's not, uh, that can't understand Afrikaans, he says, uh, for uh, an example of Afrikaans being a descriptive language, is that candy floss in Afrikaans is literally translated as ghost breath. Mm. So um, mm. that's uh, that's a very good example. Thank you, Daniel. So, yeah, uh, Cullen, before we uh, say g goodbye, I would just like mm. to uh, use this opportunity again to thank the, the sponsors of uh, this episode. Again, they've been the sponsors of my, my show for a very long time. Uh, I would almost say I think more than a year now, and that is uh, Bidvice, a South African company. Um, the, so you can only use their service if you are South African. Uh, but mm. let me tell you a bit more firstly, for those that don't know, um, Bidvice is the complete hedge against the global debasement of money, inflation and government overreach. Bidvice is South African first Bitcoin only self custody solution that helps individuals and entities buy and hold Bitcoin for the long term. Bitvice believes that everyone should hold their own Bitcoin and trust no one else. Recently, there have been a plethora of crypto custodians going bankrupt, taking their clients' Bitcoin with them. That is why Bitvice never holds your Bitcoin. They send it immediately, immediately to your own Bitcoin wallet where you hold the keys. Simply sign up to Bitvice if you're South African, link your bank account securely and buy Bitcoin in seconds. You can visit bitvice.io to begin your journey in buying and securing uh, this valuable crypto. So thank you very much, Bitvice, for sponsoring another excellent episode. There is a, a link in the description if, if that sounds interesting to any of uh, anyone in the audience. I see it. Uh, Mark Maber. Mark Maber says, uh, thanks, guys. And Dach Breaker says, thank you. Great guest. Well, now I thank you, uh, Cullen, for coming on. Thank you for your insights. Well, like I say, we didn't get to mo a lot most, to some, many of the questions that I wanted to talk about as well. So we're going mm. to have to get to that somewhere in the future. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I see your sideline opinions is taking a stab at the, the EC Zulu there. <laughs> cool. I hope he's, uh, he's in the right ballpark. <laughs> it's not bad. Uh, so he started with his closer and Koska Kolo. That's thanks a lot. My Peng Wan, Hambarashe Puti. Go well, brother. So that's cool. You're not only an old soul, but also a good one. Ah, oh, oh. All right. Thanks. Well, uh, Cullen, thank you very much for your time. It was a fascinating conversation. And like I said, I'll definitely be chatting to you again in the future. And then before we say goodbye, also just thank you to the all the questions from the, the audience. Thank you for all your comments and thank you for your, your very interesting input. Your your questions and your comments form part of the content it makes it it enriches it so Cullen, i hope you have an excellent week ahead uh, all the best to your project i'm looking at it very closely and uh, yeah if, if you want to follow uh, Cullen's work you can see there will be a link there's a link in the description of the youtube uh, video that will link you to his uh, twitter account where you can go follow and check out what he's doing it's very interesting i highly recommend uh, now and then but uh, making a stop there just to see uh what what he's up to it's very good work but yeah cullen keep doing what you're doing and uh, all the best I, I really uh admire your your dedication to preserving something that's beautiful and something that deserves preserving thank you thank you it's been lovely um chatting with you thanks Ed. All right. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you for your time uh, in uh, in the, this busy week. And I hope you have an excellent week ahead. Excellent weekend. Stay safe. Think for yourself. Think ahead. And I'll see you next week for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. And God bless.